For the first time, we're in Johnson in Renfrewshire and it's Valentine's night. So will it be all hearts and flowers or rows and arguments? Let's find out. Debate night is the only show in Scotland where you get to put your questions to the people in power, answering them on our panel this evening. The Deputy Leader of Scottish Labour, Dame Jackie Bailey, MSP, she's the current Scottish Politician of the Year. Party spokesperson for health and social care, Jackie recently cancelled her retirement plans because she is confident Labour could win at the next Holyrood election. Patrick Hart Harvey is co-leader of the Scottish Greens and MSP for Glasgow. Patrick is also following the Butte House Agreement, the Minister for Zero Carbon Buildings, Active Travel and Tenants' Rights. Also with us tonight from the SNP, Economy Spokesperson Drew Henry. Drew first got interested in politics over 40 years ago at the 1979 devolution referendum. He went on to be elected first to Highland Council, then as an MP eight years ago for Inverness, Nairn, Badenoch and Strathspey. Graham Simpson is the Scottish Conservative MSP for Central Scotland. Before entering politics, Graham worked for over 25 years in journalism, latterly as chief sub-editor of the Scottish Sun. And finally, award-winning comedian and writer Joe Caulfield with us tonight. Joe's been a writer for Graham Norton, Ruby Wax and Joan Rivers, as well as building a comedy career that's led to her being called one of the best female stand-ups in the country. Joe lives in Leith, but is currently touring with her new show, Here Comes Trouble. So we have been warned. Please welcome Welcome them all to debate night. And of course, welcome to our studio audience here in Johnson. Our first time here, it's great to be with you. And you can join in the discussion from home, wherever you are in Scotland. BBC DN is the hashtag you need right now on social media. And our debate night podcast will be available for you to download straight after the show. So, a lot to get through tonight in Johnson. Let's get started. Our first question comes from Linda Murray. Good evening, Linda. Good evening. Uh, was the Scottish Government correct to freeze the council tax when Renfrewshire Council are cutting vital services to the learning disabled and elderly in our communities? Thank you, Linda. Uh, reports today of a real breakdown in relations between COSLA and the Scottish Government uh, over this. Uh, COSLA calling for an urgent meeting with Hamza Youssef. L Linda, in terms of local services here, what are, what are you worried about? I'm directly worried about um, the HSCP going to our IGB um, and with a proposal to close my daughter's day centre for learning disabled, uh, to merge that to save some money uh, as part of their big gap uh, in their budget. OK, thank you. Drew, Drew Hendry, a former leader of Highland Council, you know uh, how important local government finances are at the moment. Was this a mistake in hindsight? Uh, no, I don't think it was. I think one of the biggest uh, worries that people have when I go out on the doorsteps and speak to people is the cost of living crisis that they're facing at the moment. And I think when you look at the strain that's been put in household budgets, we've seen Liz Truss's mini budget blew up and caused mortgages and rents to skyrocket. We've seen Brexit increase food prices in the shops from 62%, um, sorry, 26% more than a couple of years ago uh, for food prices. And we've also seen energy bills go through the roof um, over the past couple of years as well. So those things are putting real pressures on households just now. And I don't think that household budgets can afford um, to have the, the council tax go up just now. If you look at some of the proposals in Wales, for example, Labour-run Wales, they're looking at a 26% increase in some of those for council tax. I don't think that's, that kind of thing is sustainable at all. And I think it's the right decision to freeze the council tax, to give people some respite, to allow them to try and get through uh, this cost of living crisis. There should be more d being done at Westminster. And if the Chancellor in his last uh, statement hadn't, trimmed £19 billion out of public services, which has gone underreported, there might be more leeway, uh, but there just isn't the leeway for... But this falls uh, on you. you. You're responsible for local government finance in Scotland. In this local area here, there's a £50 million black hole now as a result of the decision to freeze yeah. the council tax. That's yeah. down to decisions taken well, at, at Holyrood. Well, decisions taken at Westminster, where I'm an MP, mean that there is less money coming to Scotland through the consequentials. If you look at, for example, 
the NHS funding that came from the last budget. They'll say there was a £10.8 million increase. That lasts for about five hours in a year in the Scottish NHS. It's nothing. And of course, it's blown out of the water by the inflation rate, which has been rampant. It's gone up again. Uh, today we see in the figures inflation has gone up again. So any money that is coming up is being wiped out by that. So it removes the room for manoeuvre. And there is no assistance coming from the Chancellor. We've asked for things like a £400 energy rebate for people. We've asked for mortgage interest re relief to be applied. Uh, we've asked for help with food prices, but neither the Tories nor the Labour Party at Westminster are talking about the cost of living crisis. That's nonsense. In the finance bill, they didn't mention it at all nonsense. in their summing up in the finance bill. Well, I know we've because got, I was there we've, in the We've chamber. got Jackie Bailey here, Deputy Leader of, of Scottish Labour. Drew Henry says the cost of living crisis is the number one priority. We'll find out from the audience right now. And that's why council tax needs to be kept down. So, so I agree that the cost of living crisis is having a huge impact on people. But the SNP promised that a council tax freeze would be fully funded. That was at 5%. They've only given local authorities less than, a, I think, about 2.5%. 5%, something like that. So half of what they actually require, which is why we're then seeing cuts to services. And we know that a council tax freeze it disproportionately helps those who are better off. And the services we're losing are things like learning disability services in this area. And I used to be the uh, convener of the cross-party group on learning disability, so I understand the importance of day services. But let me pick up a couple of other points, because whilst the government on one hand is saying we're doing lots for the cost of living crisis. That's why we're freezing your council tax. They're putting your water bill up by 8.8%. And they're also changing income tax so that you, if you earn, I think it's about £29,000, um, are paying more in Scotland than you are in England. And you're paying more to get less. It's not consistent. We need to, yes, focus on the cost of living, but let's stop the smoke and mirrors that the SNP government are engaging in because it will cost services in our local communities for some of the it's most not vulnerable smoke and people. It's when people can't it put food on the face. Let's find out what matters most to the audience. Man in the black top. I completely accept Drew's point in terms of Westminster absolutely does need to be doing more. After all, the, the current cost of living crisis is in fact a Westminster manufactured cost, cost of living crisis. However, there is legitimacy in what Jackie's also saying, in the sense that a blanket council tax freeze is not... It's, that doesn't return any money back to low-income families. It just puts a ceiling on what they're already paying and it, it further restricts local authorities who are dependent on this council tax increase to then, if you like, gain that extra level of funding from those within our communities who can afford it. And indeed, she makes again a legitimate point that it's those with on low incomes who are disproportionately impacted by the loss of the services at the public level. So it's a double whammy. Yeah. Patrick Harvey, you didn't know anything about this council tax freeze until it was announced. Was it a mistake? Uh, and local government, uh, I think, were in the same position as well. This was a party political announcement by the First Minister at the SNP party conference. Would you be expected to be consulted we about were, it, though? Yeah, uh, we, were, we were pretty clear at that time that the process was not good. Uh, and the policy itself of the council tax freeze would not have been our priority. There's a huge amount in the Scottish government, uh, in the Scottish budget, that is right, whether that's things like the Scottish child payment, whether it's uh, investment in public services, and actually over the years, the changes in income tax in Scotland, which means that it's high earners who pay uh, a bit more. That means there's an extra £1.5 billion a year, every year, in the Scottish government uh, budget for public services. Uh, Linda's got her hand I'm, up again. That's not what she's asking about. She's no, asking no, no. about local I'm, services here. Absolutely. I'm not going to shy away from the fact that local services and national services are under huge pressure, just as household budgets are under huge pressure. That's not because of the council tax freeze. But what we need and what councils need, if we're going to get this right in future, is to give them more powers. Not just give them a bigger block grant from the centre, but give them the powers that they need to set policies that are right for their own local community. We've started to do that. Things like allowing them to charge more council tax for second homes and empty homes. Things like a tourism tax. There's a, a whole range of environmental taxes that we can give to local government level that are best used at local level because the circumstances are different in each local community. If we do that, 
will be much closer to the European norm, where actually a local government has a wide range of powers to make the decisions that are right for their own local community, instead of the very, very centralised system that we have in Scotland at the moment. We're moving in the right direction, but I think this debate needs to spur us on to genuine reform of the council tax, which is an outdated, broken and unfair system. Let's hear more from the people of Johnson. Man in the back row with the cap on, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm now looking for more finer details on what it's going to be like if we were to vote for you, Jackie. But what is the plan and how you would sort that out? I know for the, we've obviously lived through the last 13 years of SNP, so we know what we're getting with them, we know where we're, we're sitting, but what I'm really looking for is more finer details after you is how, but obviously with that been a problem, the council tax, what's your plan? Have you got into government to fix that? What's it going to look like for us on a day-to-day -day basis? So it's more about the finer detail than just what we need to do and all. What is your plan today of you win the next election? OK, Jackie? Well, we're setting out that detail, both in the context of a UK general election and we'll publish our manifesto with all that detail in it. But, of course, this is devolved to the Scottish Parliament. So prior to 2026, we will set that detail <coughs> out for people. But if you look at the past, we actually participated in government working groups when they talked about replacing the council tax. There was broad agreement about what needed to be done. We came up with a detailed proposal that was a property tax with more bans that was much fairer across the board and actually lifted some of the people with the least income out of paying for council tax at all. Um, the Scottish Government have promised a lot, but they've delivered literally nothing. And for the past 17 years, they promised to cancel, scrap the council tax was the, the slogan, and replace it with a local income tax. And they took fright and ran away from it. And since then, we have this unfair, outdated system where the majority of people are paying too much. It needs rebalanced and it needs refocused. And we will set that detail out. OK, uh, Graham Simpson from the Scottish Conservatives. Our Scotland's Future, uh, Gordon Brown's uh, group, has suggested today uh, a property tax should replace council tax here in Scotland. Do you agree with that? Mm. Well, I want to get back to Linda's actual well, no, question. Well, answer that question first, I will, please. I will. And I'll then come, on, come to on to that. that. But Linda's question is, is fundamental to what's going on here. I was also a councillor uh, for 10 years in South Lanarkshire, and every single year we as councillors had to wrestle with budget cuts, and it's the same now. And actually, I think right now, is probably the worst budget we've ever seen in Scotland for councils. And the, the, the impact of that, the impact of that, which is what Linda touched on when she asked the question, is local services will be cut. And they're often the services that hit the poorest people in communities. And, you know, I know about the proposals in South Lancashire, where I live, and, you know, they're looking at cutting, you know, ed education, cuts to teacher numbers, and, things like that and but is the and system fit for purpose yeah. I th I think there is merit this is my personal view there is merit in in looking uh, at the system um, but the <laughs> fundamental point is that local government for years for decades actually has been underfunded in Scotland and that's why you're in the, we're in the position that we are now in so every single council is now looking at making quite severe cuts. And we're in the position today, to right today, COSLA, the body that represents all of Scotland's councils, is in dispute now with the government that only recently they signed an agreement with called the Verity House Agreement. That is shattered. That's gone. You do know that there are councils in England that yeah. are going bankrupt because mm. of UK government choices. Yeah. We've, we've not been perfect at protecting local government. I'm not going to pretend that. But we've done the best that we can with a very, very difficult hand that's been dealt to us through years upon years upon years of brutal austerity budgets yeah. from the UK. We do need to fix a lot of what we do in Scotland. A modern, proper property tax, a fairer system of local government and more powers for local government. We need to continue to move in that so direction, you're in but, agreement. but we also need... So we you're in agreement need, with Gordon, we you're in agreement with Gordon Brown's... Fair, yes. So I, you're I've in been, agreement with our Scotland's future on I've this? I've been advocating for a replacement for the council tax, whether that's a land value-based uh, approach or a modern property tax, for a long, so, long time. Patrick, there, but there we also need a do you fair think, funding settlement from do you the UK think, government, do you which has been cutting our budgets and not keeping up with inflation. Do you think this is a fair budget for Scottish councils? 
I think there's a great deal, far more in this budget. Do that you I think this is a fair budget for councils? Of, and I'll and be proud to vote for it because is it's going it to fair budget for tens councils? of thousands of children out of poverty in Scotland. That's not to be sniffed at. All right, you let's go back answer. to the audience here. Lady in the front row down here. Yeah. Upon your point in education, schools have been struggling for a long time. Mm -hmm. We've been promised by the government that children are going to get iPads, that they're going to get bicycles, yeah. that there's going to be more teachers, more jobs, that there's going to be a reduction in workload. We're still waiting on all of it, and all we get is more cuts, more austerity, more teachers having to buy their own resources, yeah. more children struggling, waiting to get mental health support. Education feels like it's on its knees and yeah. nothing ever changes. Joe Caulfield, was the Scottish Government right to freeze the council tax? It feels a little bit like a thing done because it, it sounds good, it sounds like it's helping people. But when you say, you know, so then poorer households will go, well, we don't have to find extra money. But some households can afford that council tax and shouldn't be frozen. But also, I was slightly confused then because I don't know you, and I was thinking, sure I was introduced and you were a conservative. That's right. Yes. <laughs> so you're responsible <laughs> for all the austerity, which is, as you say, wrecking all the councils in England that have gone bankrupt because they've, the councils have been underfunded. And it, it's always a false economy not to invest yeah. in the, your future. So the people that are not getting money now, the children are not getting money, they don't grow into useful members of society. And we're from 2010, we're seeing that now, problems everywhere, all down to austerity. I was interested in what Patrick was saying. I think that is a way... It has to be changed, um, the, the council tax needs updating, because it, it's not fair, um, but we have to pay for stuff at the same time. Yeah. Uh, Linda, you, you asked the question, what do you think about what you've heard? Um, I agree wholeheartedly with some of the things you're saying, but as an unpaid carer who works for a living, supports my daughter, uh, who's 36, I might add, she's not a young thing anymore, and neither am I. I think that, yes, <laughs> they need to look at it now. Mm -hmm. I think it's unfair that they haven't raised the... I'd rather they put an extra pound or two pounds on my council tax so that my daughter can continue <coughs> to attend her day centre so that I can work. I need to work. To, the cost of living is hitting us too. More so because we are unpaid carers. The council are pushing back on us to take over the care for our loved ones. Linda, thank you. Thanks for your question and thanks for sharing your story with us here tonight. You can feel the heat in the room. Big year ahead with the general election coming up. Uh, the polls tell us that there are a lot of voters on the move at the moment and a lot of people who are still undecided. So uh, let's try something tonight. If, if you are in the process of changing your vote from how you voted last time, or you are undecided right now, and maybe you've come here tonight to try and get some answers to help you decide. Put your hands up just now and keep them up. Keep them up for a few minutes. Um, lady in the mustard top down there, what's your position at the moment? What are you thinking? Well, I, uh, in the past, have voted SNP in general elections, but uh, in the next election, I have to say I'm undecided, probably leaning towards Labour. I think we need to have a change from the... Uh, national um, Conservative government in Westminster um, because of the, um, the heritage it's leaving behind from the austerity agenda. We, we need to get money into things and get things moving and have services for this lady and her daughter. And that's just one example. There are numerous examples okay. I could mention. Thank you for sharing that. Gentleman in the check shirt with the glasses right yeah. in the second row there. Yeah, what, what's your position? I think we're left with um, the un un unable to vote for anyone. There's no one standing out, you know. You'd as well just shutting your eyes and crossing a box at the election and hoping for the best. Um, Patrick Harvey just sat forward in his seat <coughs> to really carefully listen to you there. What are you looking to hear from <laughs> politicians? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, we're talking about... I mean, I worked in the public sector for about 30 years. I'm retired now, <coughs> so I can see what I think about it. <laughs> um, and it is so badly managed, and there is so much money wasted, and there's no accountability. <laughs> and the, I was looking at the, the ferry scandal. Now, there's maybe 260 million that could have went into public services. 
um, this went under the carpet. But that's the tip of the iceberg. You know, there was so many mon so much money spent and wasted come the end of the financial year because, oh, we've got 80,000 we need to spend. What do you need? And that is how it went for a long so, time. So you want to see reform? I, I think, that. The, yeah. Okay. It's not okay. all about taxing. It's about reform and remanagement. Let me go right to the back row. Lady in the black in the middle there. Yes, on you go. Yes, you. Hi, I've always been a SNP voter, and but this year I've, I've absolutely lost a lot of faith, a lot of confidence, and I am leaning towards Labour, but I still feel that I was brought up to believe that Labour was all about the working person, the working class, and I can say from a personal experience, I brought up my children to be very good members of society. I'm on my own, so I have a single income household, and I am absolutely ignored. I get no help whatsoever, because I don't have young children. I'm not claiming social, I'm not disabled. Um, I'm not, you know, pension age. So in between that, I feel as, unless you're married, and unless you're living as a couple in a household, you're not considered, you know, the, the, at, at no point has the SNP considered people who, to me, that live on their own, and it's a single income household, and they're, you know, Labour's supposed to, to encourage me to work. It doesn't encourage me to work, but it, actually, if I sign on the brew, I'll have more money than I have working. I, I can see they're all carefully listening to you tonight. Man in the blue shirt. There as well, yes. Yeah, I, I tend to ag agree with the lady here that, in fact, that what has happened, I think, uh, over the years is that the trust and the, the, the of, of, of politicians of all parties has dissipated over the years. And I'm in the position of thinking, well, I used to vote SNP, I have voted Labour, I've voted Tory in the past, over a period of years. Now I'm wondering, who is worth voting for? Who do I trust and, and, and take this forward? That was fascinating, and we'll do that again in the run-up to the general election. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, you're watching an audience uh, from Johnson tonight in debate night. Next week, we're going to be in Glasgow, so if you'd like to come along and be part of the audience for that show, Dundee the week after, just go to our website, bbc.co.uk forward slash debate night, and click on the link. Let's go to question two tonight, which comes from Sean Murphy. Sean, good evening. Good evening. With the latest increase in minimum unit pricing, is the government's ultimate aim prohibition for the less well-off? Uh, Sean, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Scotland, the first country in the world to introduce minimum unit pricing on the sale of alcohol. It's going to be increased from 50 to 65p. If the vote goes through, it'll be end of September, the change. Graham Simpson, you support this change? Uh, no, I don't support the change. Um, and the reason I don't support the change is that the initial scheme hasn't worked. Um, there's no evidence to support um, the, you know, the, the assertion that minimum unit pricing has um, changed people's drinking habits. And when we're talking, we've, to, we've spoken already about cost of living. So this, this will actually put, this will put up the cost of, for instance, a bottle of wine to around six pounds. Now, you know, that's quite, that's quite, that, that's a lot. Um, and it's penalizing responsible drinkers it's penalizing less well-off people um, i just don't think it's necessary and you you use the word prohibition i might not go that far but you know it it, it certainly is uh, affecting people who who are not necessarily you know huge drinkers causing harm to themselves i think it's it's actually disrespectful to a large part of the population. Joe Caulfield? Um, I agree with you <laughs> on this. Good. Um, because, uh, That's the first. It, yeah. it, well, uh, I agree that it doesn't work, and you are pricing it. So it's, it's not, those people are not going to now not drink. Um, and also, if things are so terrible, and now we go, oh, now we can't even drink um, to get through it. But it, it, hasn't, it hasn't worked. And I think the only thing you can do, I mean, I know it's younger people like this lady's age here. They don't drink as much. It's my age group. We're the ones drinking ourselves to death. So actually, people, younger people are much more responsible with alcohol than we are. And I think maybe this seems like a soundbite thing to do. It's not needed. I think younger people are more sensible about alcohol. 
It's moving, moving, moving away from it as a culture. The only thing you can do is make it l seem less attractive to be drunk, you know. <laughs> and I know that people in pubs aren't meant to be able to serve someone drunk. Well, where I live in Leith, they certainly are, <laughs> because I get served every time. But, <laughs> but you know, if it, if it, that's the only way I think you can change it is to go to make it like smoking was. People were like, do you know what? I can really smell your smoke. I don't like it. that people would go suddenly go, oh, it's not so nice to be really drunk. The police can't do anything about drunks, can they? They can't police people being drunk. So you can't say, oh, we'll find people. So I think it's a sort of made up policy because it's not helping. If you really want to stop people drinking, they need residential care and nobody's ever going to pay to put people in residential care if they say I've got an alcohol problem. Uh, last year, Drew Hendry, 1,276 people died in Scotland as a result of alcohol. That's the highest number since 2008. Is Joe right? Is this just a made up policy to grab uh, headlines? No, I don't think so. And I think when you speak to public health experts, Patrick will have probably better detail from the Scottish Parliament and government. I think when you speak to public health experts, they do say that it is making a difference. And, and indeed, we do have to do something about the culture that we have with alcohol in Scotland. And I think it was, I, when I was, you mentioned I was on Highland Council earlier, I worked with uh, a, a councillor called Dr Foxley. He was a Lib Dem at the time. And, uh, you know, we used to discuss this about the fact that this would be a, a good thing to do. And he was very exercised at that time about the fact that this should be taken forward. And, and I, I don't quite, I don't think it's true that there's no evidence that shows this isn't working. Absolutely. I'm pretty sure there is evidence that shows this is having an impact and has actually improved public health outcomes uh, for people on drinking. I don't have the figures, but perhaps Patrick yeah. might have Patrick, them. I'll come to you in a second, but let me just hear from the audience, because <clears throat> they're the ones that will be affected by this. Lady with the blonde here. Yeah, sure. Um, I work in health, so I really support what you just said. I don't think you know, there is evidence out there that it is making a difference. Um, and maybe young people are drinking less because it is inaffordable. We have got a culture we need to change in the UK around alcohol in particular. Uh, maybe we need to look at, you know, with the pricing going up, what's done with that money at the moment. I believe it goes to retailers, but maybe it could go into, you know, addiction support or helping people with alcohol problems. I think what we're seeing is the money is, not if you've got an addiction to alcohol, you will spend the money regardless of the price. But we're talking about it you know, a softer end, trying to stop this culture of everyone drinking. In fact, it helped with cigarettes when we put the price of cigarettes up <laughs> to, you know, £10 a pack, even more. So I think we have to start somewhere with alcohol. And I think there is research to prove that it is, it is making a difference. But people do buy uh, knockoff bags. That is the problem. People I see smoking who don't have much money, they're not paying for those in a supermarket. They're all buying knockoff bags. And that's the worry that I think then people will buy terrible alcohol. Uh, Patrick Harvey, uh, the, the worry around this is that the people who are most at risk from harm with alcohol, they're not, they're, they're not price sensitive on this. They will simply stop spending on other things, on heating and eating as well to find the money. They're not going to be touched by this. I think we need to be really clear about what this policy is intended to do and what it's not intended to do. First of all, in relation to the question, it's not intended to uh, is effectively get prohibition for the less well-off. That's not the intention. And it's also not intended to be an intervention in the lives specifically of people who have very severe alcohol addiction issues. You do need a different set of services and a different set of measures to deal with those issues. It's intended to do two things. One is deal with the issue of very, very cheap alcohol by putting that minimum unit pricing in. And those products... Uh, are often used uh, by people in, in a self-destructive or an abusive or an unhealthy way. And also it's intended to achieve a population-wide effect of just reducing consumption a bit. And I'm one of those people who enjoys a drink, and I should probably reduce my consumption a bit. Uh, I, went th I went through the January thing this time for the first time, <laughs> not drinking January. for a month. It was boring. I'm, I'm not going to do that again, but I am going to try and reduce the amount that I drink in general a bit, because that's a good thing. And the evidence is clear. Just the other week, we had a whole host of public health experts giving evidence to the Scottish Parliament Committee that's looking at this. And the one MSP who was refusing to listen to, refusing to accept that evidence, was getting a dressing down by these experts who know their stuff, saying this set of policies work. My biggest regret, actually, about some of this is that this came in, it was first proposed uh, by the SNP when they were a minority administration. 
and they put it forward. And Labour put forward some good ideas at that point as well, things like banning caffeinated alcohol products. There was some good body of evidence. Both parties at that point thought our real goal here is to shoot down the good ideas coming from the other side. And we ended up with a bill that was gutted of all its serious, uh, positive, creative content. It came back again in the next session and actually there was a better degree of consensus and people worked together across party lines and we got it through and we got the minimum unit uh, pricing through and it has been effective. It's when we work together across party lines the, that we achieve far so more. So where do you stop, Patrick? Sean's worried about we're heading eventually to prohibition. This is a 30% rise mm. in the minimum price. How often do we keep raising it and where do you stop? Well, I think there is a good argument that, that it does have to, to keep pace with inflation. And so maybe that rise at the current time is higher than people might expect because inflation has gone higher. I do want to echo the point, though, about the, the retailers who are raking in some of the, the profits from this. We're making the case that the, there's existing legislation for a public health supplement on the big alcohol retailers. We want to use that power and make sure we take some of their profits back in to invest in the public services that people depend on. That's what I think would, would you know, complete the circle on this, so that you've not only got an intervention that's about reducing consumption, but you're putting that money to good use. Uh, let me hear from the lady in the back row there, yes. I'm actually horrified just now to learn that it's the retailers that get that money. Yeah. I yeah. always Pretty assumed bad. that yeah. it would go towards no. public health. No. So I'm actually delighted to hear you say that, Patrick, because yeah. I think public health need the money um, for all sorts of uh, things that are going on Absolutely. In, in people's health. Myself, I'm a, a messengered person and I had wanted to really ask the question about patient commissioner. Where are we with that? I'm not quite sure if you'll allow me to ask that oh, question. Okay. But we, I would like to know, we, but I do agree with you, Patrick. I think. The money should go to public health. Okay, we, yeah. we probably need to stick to this just to make sure okay. we get through everything else tonight. Jackie Bailey, are we heading towards prohibition at this rate, do you think? Um, I don't think we are, and I am very clear that this is one tool in the toolbox, is not the entire toolbox, because Absolutely. there is some evidence that it works at a population level in stopping people from drinking things like white lightning and the, the really cheap, horrible alcohol that was there. Um, but for those who are harmful drinkers, there is equally evidence that they are not eating or heating their homes in order to buy drinks. So, so we need to be very alive and sensitive to that. I think a lot of people are upset that it's a 30% increase in one go. Um, and the reality is, whilst there is a measure of inflation that people have applied, equally, if you look at a purchasing price index, our purchasing power has not risen by the same amount. So there are different measures that we should consider. So whilst I'm in favour of retaining minimum unit pricing, I've yet to do the modelling to be convinced about the level that it would be set at. But all those years ago that Patrick's talking about, Labour actually came forward with the proposal to take that money back because it's additional money that's not about a supermarket's profit. It's additional money that comes about because of minimum unit pricing. And the reason we did that is because there were cuts in the budget by the SNP to alcohol and drug treatment projects, you know? And we said, look, here's the way of taking that money back in and investing it in helping people in lots of other ways. And, you know, if there are other campaigners sitting here, they'll talk to you about the need for rehabilitation, whether it's drugs or alcohol. They'll talk to you about community services that aren't getting the level of funding they should. So we think something that's very proportionate Focus just on minimum unit pricing, it, clawing that back into the public sector, particularly to health, is the right thing to do. Sean, are you reassured <laughs> this evening? Not really. I did want to make the point the lady behind me made uh, about the profits going to the, the supermarkets, etc. But we keep hearing about the, the, the evidence that, you know, that it's working. But alcohol deaths, as far as I'm un I understand, uh -huh. have increased. So I, I don't think it does work. I think it's just another unnecessary tax. OK, your views on everything you hear on the programme tonight. BBC DN is the hashtag you need on social media. Uh, we've got a lot to get through. So let's go to a third question of the night, which comes from Julia, Julia Braun-Raven. Julia, evening. Good evening. 
What kind of a reform does NHS Scotland need to remain free? Thank you. What kind of reform does NHS Scotland need to remain free? And his resignation uh, outgoing, uh, uh, resignation letter outgoing Health Secretary Michael Matheson said it requires major reform, his words. Jackie Bailey, um, UK's Labour health spokesman, West Streeting, has been in Singapore, I think, looking at the health system out there. What kind of reform do we need here in Scotland and how big should that be to the health service? So, let me say that the NHS is in crisis at the moment. Anybody who has interacted with it or works in it will understand just the pressure that they are under. And we know there are one in six people in Scotland on a waiting list. That's more than 800,000 people. So we all know somebody, a friend, you know, a member of the family that's stuck waiting um, and stuck sometimes in pain and struggling with that. Um, so what we've argued, and I will bring forward proposals that we've started to outline, is that actually what you care about is where your local um, health centre is, where your local hospital is. You don't much care about where the headquarters of the health board is. And what we want to do is drive down a lot of that talent, that ability into primary care, because acute care needs primary care to function, and primary care and social care alongside it need our attention and investment. So they were promised 800 GPs by the SNP. That's not happening. Audit Scotland have said, mm. you know, that's pie in the sky. We need more GPs. We need more people working in our communities because we're all getting older. Unfortunately, we're not necessarily healthier, but maintaining people nearer to home in their communities has to be the priority for the NHS. The acute care that we get, you know, whether it's cancer treatment or others, some of it is world class, but the problem with the pressure on the system is, for example, we haven't met the 31-day cancer target. We haven't met the 62-day cancer target. People are presenting with cancer at later stages. We need to get much more focus on prevention rather than treating crisis, because if we simply stick to a sticking plaster approach, then it's not gonna work. So we've come forward with proposals to you know, scrap the number of health boards, not because we want to centralise, quite the opposite. We want to localise and make sure primary care is robust and we will come forward with initiatives to tackle waiting times, to end delayed discharge, to actually put the NHS back on the footing that it deserves to be on. And I have to say, I want to involve the clinical community in making sure that we have the best patient care possible. Okay, so the consultants, the doctors, the nurses, the people who know about the NHS need to have a much louder voice and we will deliver that okay, for them. Okay, okay. Lady in the front row down here, what do you think? Hi, thanks for coming in. Um, Jackie, no disrespect, but we've heard all this before. Not from me. SNP um, government, we've heard all this before as well. And we are in crisis, the NHS yes. is in crisis. I totally understand, I totally agree. We all agree about that. We need answers. We do need answers. We can't keep going on like this. It's, I understand what you're trying to do. I think if we all had a big wish list, it would be fantastic. But see if you're actually sitting around a table and you're all coming up with these proposals, all we want is it is actually deliverable and make sure it yes. is deliverable. We, we don't need for people to sit round and say, yes, that would be a great idea, that would be fantastic. We need these answers on that table okay. and we need and very briefly, every, Jackie, there's absolutely, a lot of people with hands up. Absolutely everything we're doing is grounded in evidence, in discussion with clinicians, with nurses, you know, with the trade unions. Um, they are round the table with us, making sure that what we do is deliverable right, okay. and grounded Drew in reality. Hendry? Yeah, I, I mean, it, you know, it's stunning to hear this from uh, Jackie when you've got, I'm, I'm at Westminster, and you know, when you've got people like West Streeting saying that he wants to open the drawers for privatization of the NHS uh, to come in, when you've got a, a, a Labour Party and a Tory party and the Lib Dems who are supporting Brexit, which has been starving the NHS of the staff that it needs and their care system across the board in Scotland, these are the real problems. Not only that, I mentioned earlier about the 10.8 million pounds that came out of the autumn, autumn statement for Scotland. That is nothing, it's gone in a heartbeat, even less than that. And there is no proposal from UK Labour 
to invest in anything other than continuing the Tories' austerity that's programmes nonsense. That's nonsense. at Westminster. You, you know that's you have, the fact. You have been in charge well, where of are the we? NHS. Jackie, you've Jackie, been in tell charge me where, of the NHS, which tell me where that money's coming from. the past 17 years. Jackie, tell me and where Labour say that money is coming from. Under the SNP, from. the NHS has declined. I've seen it. I've seen we it have the best performing A&E in the, the UK. We have look, more doctors look, and nurses per head of population you, you than anywhere else in the UK. About, you are delusional the best about the state of the NHS. Nurses and doctors and in the UK. That is not fair to the patients or the staff who work in it every single day. OK, I'm looking out here at uh, lots of people with their head, uh, hands up and lots of people shaking their heads. Let me go first to the lady at the back with the glasses. Yes. The NHS... It's, it is in crisis, and I agree with what everyone is saying, that it is completely in crisis. It is impossible to get a doctor's appointment. People are on waiting lists for years and years. People cannot even register with an NHS dentist. And we have created a two-tier health system where the wealthy can get appointments within reasonable times. Sometimes these appointments, they cost hundreds of pounds. They could cost us all of someone's disposable income for a month, two months, three months while the rest of us, we have no care, no support, no follow-ups. How do we prevent this? How do we prevent Scotland from becoming a society where the rich can be healthy and the rest of us are left? Patrick Harvey, when that lady said we've got a two-tier health system, you were nodding your head. Is that what we've got in Scotland now? I, I think there are real dangers that we end up going that way and we mustn't. Yeah. Uh, we mustn't accept the idea that if you can afford to pay for private health care, uh, that you get a, a standard of, of health care that's acceptable. And if you, if you can't afford that, you, you, you don't expect that. That's, that's not acceptable to us. Uh, this, look, this debate is far too important to be a party political spat. All four of the political parties here are in government in different parts of the UK. All of the NHS in every part of the UK is struggling very, very severely. Uh, that's because of workforce issues. It's because of uh, the loss of freedom of movement that's impacted on, uh, on the healthcare workforce. It's because, of course, of COVID and the incredible challenges uh, about trying to recover a healthcare system from that. It's happening in lots of other countries as well. These are severe challenges. We collectively bear responsibility for them, uh, for having... The, the decisions that we have made and the decisions we are yet to make. It is going to take investment. It is going to take organisational reform. I have to say, I'm, I'm not yet convinced that reorganising health boards uh, is, is an answer to that. Uh, that feels to me a little bit like uh, you know, reorganising the, the administration rather than the actual delivery we found of health care. But, but the I'll, I do, it's it's very, can I uh, apologise? I just do briefly, just want yeah. to agree briefly with one thing that Jackie said that's really important. Prevention and living in a healthier society mm -hmm. is absolutely going to be critical. If we don't get that right, we're going to still be... It's, the, it's like uh, people falling into a stream. You're pushing people more into the stream and you're having to fish them out uh, of the river. We're already if, we, if people keep more, falling into the stream, Patrick, you're going to have to keep fishing spent. them out. And the Institute not, Fiscal yeah. Studies not says necessarily last week, on a healthier society. We're spending more money, we have more doctors yeah. and nurses, but we're seeing less patients yeah. than we were seeing before COVID. That's the issue that needs to be reformed, isn't it? Well... It, it, it depends what exactly you mean by seeing more patients. Are we intervening to help people to be healthier? I don't think we're doing that enough. Uh, and if, if, we, if we're not doing that, then we're going to create more and more of this problem. We, we also have huge advantages, right, in facing this problem. We're a, a society now that has technological solutions that people who invented the NHS might only have dreamt of. If, we, if we're not dealing with some of the, the, the causes of ill health, if we're constantly firefighting the scale of the problem, then we're not going to give ourselves the space and the time okay. to, to use those modern technologies that could be transforming our state right. of health as well as our health care I, I want to hear from more people in there. There's a man in the blue striped shirt there. Yes, on you go. That was going to be my question. The NHS um, comment, is it true that NHS Scotland seem to be doing less with more? Um, but just, if I can just yes. tag on a wee quick one to that. Um, have any of the politicians on the panel actually shadowed a nurse for a 12-hour shift? Because they, you might, it's easy to say that we've got more nurses on the ground. They are run ragged, yes. and they are doing an absolutely fantastic job. I'll, I'll check in with the panel in just a second. Lady in the white top there, yes. There you go. I would sack the boats. Definitely sack them. But, no. I was 16 months trying to get an appointment with my GP. 
I eventually got one in January there to discover four GPs have left, practice nurses have left two of them, and every reception staff's no there, and it's one locum doctor they've brought in, one reception staff and one nurse. So how were the patients no notified that this was going on? How were we no told? You try to go to another surgery, you're told you can't do that. There's a ban on transferring yep. surgeries because yep. you're registered with a doctor. How can you be registered with a doctor when they've all left? Thank you. Lady with the black hair at the back, yeah. They're talking about prevention of illnesses and things like that. Um, but how do you prevent an illness if you can't even see or speak to a GP? You phone, your first hurdle is trying to get past the receptionist. Mm -hmm. Can I have an appointment? Mm, we'll decide whether you qualify for an appointment. If you do get an appointment, it's a phone appointment. How can you diagnose somebody over the phone if you're not willing yeah. to see them? Yeah. Can I ask you, just put your hands down for a second. Has anybody in the audience here gone to private medical care for help for an operation for something? Uh, oh, three in a row, actually. Well, let's start with the lady on the, uh, your left there. We'll work our way along. What was your experience of it? What happened? Um, hi, I had a pelvic mesh implant in 2011, and I've constantly been in and out of hospital here, lied to many times, and ended up having to pay £27,000 to go to America Whoa. to have it fully removed in pelvic reconstruction because they're unable to do it here in Scotland. Okay. I don't want to presume this, but are you, yeah, you're all, all the same, same, same yeah. experience, same story? Yeah. Right, OK. Same surgeon in America. Same <laughs> yeah. story, OK. Joe Caulfield, uh, wh what do we do about this? How, the original question was, what kind of reform do we need for the NHS in Scotland to keep it free? Well, I don't know. <laughs> what a surprise. You're allowed I mean, to it's say such that. a huge, right. huge thing. I think there's been good points made. I think Pat's a very good point with, and that goes back to council tax, with prevention, mm -hmm. making this a healthy country for children, people eating properly, exercise, are things that would impact the NHS if we were healthier. But I also think local care as well, mm -hmm. and there's something gone wrong, and it's the same in England as well, with people not being in communities where, you know, there aren't things for kids to do. They're not exercising enough, that, we do, that we're not looking after each other well enough, because we're all very separate. But I would say the only thing I would say to do is for the man who was saying, oh, they're all the same, we don't know who to vote for, I would say, please vote so that we don't have a Tory government because the figures for the NHS were so much better in 2010. Graham Simpson. Except that health in Scotland is devolved and it's been run by the SNP uh, for as long as they've been in power. So, you know, it's the SNP that are running the health system here. And, uh, you know, this has been a really interesting discussion so far. Um, I get so many complaints from people who cannot get to see a GP. And that's where it starts, isn't it? You know, if you've got a health problem, you need to go and see your, your doctor. Um, and too many people can't get to see the doctor. You know, they just can't, you can't get an appointment. You can't, sometimes you can't get past the receptionist. Or you'll find, um, I think as the lady over there said, that maybe your practice is, is, is suffering and, and it closes down. So there are real problems here. And there is a two-tier health system. It should be free at the point of use, but people are being forced to go private. And sometimes they can't afford it. I mean, the lady at the back, I'm really sorry, I couldn't quite hear everything you were saying, but I did hear the figure 27,000 pounds. People shouldn't be forced to spend 27,000 pounds. You shouldn't be, spend, be forced to spend anything to get the, a decent uh, health care and, and, you know, certainly not to be able to see a GP. But too many people are having to do that in Scotland. And that's a GP. And that, I haven't even spoken about dentists. OK. That's, well, we've talked about that before in the programme yeah, uh, as well. Um, your views from home. Uh, be part of the debate. Hashtag is BBCDN right now on social media. Fascinating question uh, last on the programme today. Our fourth question, which I really wanted to get to tonight. Something we've not talked about before on the programme, but very important. From Linda Hamilton. Linda, good evening. Um, across Scotland, there are thousands of children who can't attend school and parents who are at the end of their tether, desperate from support from services that are non-existent. What do you plan to do to support these children who are not in education? 
This is a big story right across the country, these uh, children absent from school. Are you a parent, Linda? What's your perspective? I'm in education. I'm a parent, I'm a grandparent, and I'm in education. OK, what are you seeing with this? What do you think is going on? Well, it's very, very complex. There are many reasons, but COVID was mm. one of the, the main things that probably impacted. We've got more parents working from home, um, more able to facilitate our young people being at home. Uh, the reasons that we are seeing are increasingly around anxiety. Um, children are referred and they're on the waiting list for CAMS for years, years and years at a time. Um, so parents are desperate for support, reaching out. The support right. isn't there. OK, I, I want to hear from parents on this, but Jackie, you first on this. What do we do about this problem? I think you're absolutely right. This came about, I think, during COVID. COVID exacerbated it and so many of our young people didn't get the social interactions that they would have got by being at school. So that, that frame of reference for them has been broken down. Are sanctions um, the answer? Is discipline I, I, the answer? I genuinely don't think sanctions are the answer. I think some of these young people, absolutely as you described, have social anxiety. They can't get into school. Um, it just destroys their self-confidence. So investing in CAMS, actually making sure child and adult mental health services are in place in local communities is vital. We need to support um, our educators in schools, but we need to support parents as well who are struggling to get their kids to engage. And I fear that there is a lost generation of young people who will struggle in future life because they've been brought up during COVID. And it, it's just tragic. And I don't think we're doing enough. I know in, in England at the time, they ran catch up programs and courses um, we didn't really do that in Scotland. Mm. So there's a generational impact about people's level of education, never mind actually getting kids in, into school. Um, and so it is a pressing problem, and they haven't invested in child and adult me mental health services at all to the level that's required. And, you know, we've made these points to the SNP government, educators have made these points to them, but nothing happens. Joe Caulfield. Um, well, it is a problem in Scotland and in the UK. You know, so many friends of mine with kids, and some of it was COVID. Some of it was happening before COVID because of social media. Kids really anxious, really feeling bullied, not wanting to go to school, and also older children who were then starting university in COVID who were in halls on their own and then dropped out and have not gone back to education or work. And there is not... I, I don't know whether because mental health seems invisible. So that's the last thing that governments then put in place. But there isn't help. And there's I, it just it's heartbreaking to think that someone is absolutely at the end of their tether and so upset. And then they go to get help and they're told a year to wait to talk mm -hmm. to someone. It makes me want to cry right now to think of what young people yeah. Yeah. and their parents, you know, just yeah. trying to help. They're not health professionals. This is, it has to be treated the same as a physical illness, but there's something very wrong that this is Scotland right across the board and it's older children, you know, 16, 17, 18 and beyond as well as young children. We often have questions about the waiting lists for child and adolescent mm -hmm. mental health services. L lady in the front here. Yeah, all the trade unions in Scotland have reported that there's been an uptick in violence in schools and I know of teachers who have been put in hospitals and that's not going to help anybody's anxiety. If children are seeing violence in school, they're going to be frightened to come in. And as Jackie said, we need more mental health services. Schools can't do everything and we need more support in the schools and the trade unions are asking the government for it and we're still waiting on something to happen. Drew Hendry. Well, I think this is an important issue, and I think you're right to uh, raise the, the issue that's, I think, really been magnified and uh, increased by the COVID pandemic, that um, we've had this issue, I'm a parent and a grandparent myself, um, you know, we've had this issue where, you know, people have been, young people have been taken out of uh, society effectively because of the, uh, the, the period of time when they were, you know, restricted and they couldn't go Do you think uh, sanctions are the answer for them? No, I don't. I don't think that's the right way to do it. I think we need to look at something that's progressive. I think there is room here to take the politics out of it and actually say, how do we work together across the political boundaries to say, look, this is a, a clear problem. It's happening in other nations as well. It's happening all around the world. It's happening here in Scotland. 
how do we get together and say what can we come up with collaboratively to tackle this? Well, let's put that I, know to test, is, I know it is. I know it is an important issue that's being talked about in the Scottish government at the, and at the Scottish Parliament just now across parties. And I just want to see that kind of momentum. Right. So can we take the politics out of this, Graham Simpson? How do we solve this? Come on. Well, we should take the politics out of it. It's a, it's a really serious issue. Um, you know, we spoke about mental health. And I, th I think the big problem is that children, we're talking about children, are often not getting the assessment for well, over a year. So if you're talking about somebody of a, ver a very young age, and I just think the anxiety that causes, not just for the child, but for the parents as well. You know, so we need, we do need to fix that now. It could, it could come back to what we started about uh, on, on this programme talking about, which is funding. Um, so we need to put more funding uh, into these services. Okay. Can, can we end the last question on Valentine's night with consensus? Let's find out. Patrick Harvey. Well, I mean, uh, the... I was going to say easy, not easy, but clear part of this uh, does come back to that question about funding, about giving councils and giving health boards the ability to raise the revenue they need to invest in services. So that does come back to where we started the discussion. But there are some aspects of this that are not clear and not simple because they are fundamentally new challenges. The impact of, of COVID is not just about... Uh, isolation and lack of socialization. Uh, I was really interested in the point Joe made about connecting this to the social media issues because part of what happened during COVID was not just a lack of socialization, it was redirecting socialization into a social media landscape that is very, very toxic uh, and often dehumanizing as well. And I was. I was really struck. Uh, people will have seen some of the interviews that were given by the, the mother of Brianna Jai, the, uh, the girl who was, who was murdered down south. H horrific, uh, appalling and, and traumatic event. Uh, but her mother has responded by uh, actually talking really powerfully about some of the measures that could protect young people uh, from a toxic environment on, on social media. You know, it, it can be pretty toxic for people of any age, but in particular uh, for people who feel different and what teenager doesn't feel different at some point? What young person doesn't feel different at some point? But in particular for those uh, in marginalised groups who are often being demonised and stigmatised in the media and by some politicians as well. So we need to recognise that, yes, some of this is just about that traditional issue of raising enough money to invest in our services and we need to do that better. But some of this is a fundamentally new challenge arising from the experiences of the last few years Face okay. the technology I, 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 I'm sorry, like social Jack, media. We're out of time on this, but I'm so glad we managed to talk about it this evening because it's a really big yeah. challenge for all of us. That's it for tonight. Thank you for spending your Valentine's evening with us. We're back next week in Glasgow. You can apply to be part of the show there. Uh, just go to the website right now. If you missed any of tonight's programme, we're repeated later on BBC One Scotland or you can catch it any time on the BBC iPlayer. Thank you very much indeed to my panel here tonight and to our lovely audience here in Johnson. First time here, we will be back. And of course, to you at home for watching. We'll see you next week. In the meantime, from all of us in Debate Night, stay safe, stay well, good night.